In the last two lessons, we looked at chorale-style phrases in soft and loud dynamics, as well as several orchestral chords with different characters. Chorale style is a good place to start, since it's a fairly simple texture, very homogeneous and blended. But the orchestra is a source of tremendous variety in timbre, dynamics, register, and so on. And not all music is in chorale style. The Western polyphonic tradition has given birth to many different ways of arranging multiple lines at the same time from those blended homophonic texture to more stratified contrapuntal possibilities. Once the student has become familiar with the characteristics of the instruments, the single most important thing to understand in orchestration is the concept of planes or layers of tone. Human perception is not democratic. Evolution has designed us so that there are always priorities. You may hear a lot of different conversations at a cocktail party, but you can't follow more than one in any detail. The others may intrude from time to time, but that's your attention wandering. The way perception sorts up priorities can be quite complex, but we see its effects all the time in the simplest hierarchical texture of all, melody and accompaniment, the basis of most pop music. The singer is the foreground, and the accompaniment is the background. Let's look at an instrumental example. Here's a simple accompanied melody. This is quite different from the chorales we orchestrated in the last few lessons. This melody is rhythmically independent from the lower parts. There's also a strong difference of character between melody and accompaniment. The melody is singing, cantabile, and the accompaniment is light, pizzicato. This leads us to another important principle of orchestration. The orchestration must mask the character of the underlying material. If there's no substantial contrast with the basic material, the orchestration shouldn't create one. Here's an example of what not to do. By having the second violin playing arco while the other strings are pizzicato, the second violin becomes the main line. But melodically, it's totally uninteresting. The result sounds ridiculous, creating a strong contrast where there shouldn't be any, and bringing out an insignificant line. Let's go back to our oboe and strings example. Here, the contrast in timbre makes the more lyrical main line stand out in relief. This is one of the simplest and most effective kinds of orchestration. Main melody in one family, accompaniment in another. The contrast here is appropriate and enhances the whole rather than creating a distraction. There are other possibilities, of course. If the melody, for example, were given to a trumpet or a flute instead of the oboe, the orchestration would still work, but the musical character would be different, more brilliant with the trumpet, or more reserved and paler with the flute. We should also mention that the accompaniment here includes a more subtle hierarchy. The bass line is doubled in octaves, in addition to being the furthest away from the oboe and register. The bass line and the oboe line make up a solid two-part counterpoint, as they normally should in harmonic texture. The inner parts in the pizzicato accompaniment are a bit less in evidence. They blend into the harmonic mass. Let's continue the same example, making it a bit longer. As the oboe completes its phrase here, the first violins come in with an answering phrase. Even though the first violins and the pizzicato strings are nominally from the same family, the planes of tone remain very clear. This is because pizzicato and arco sound like different families. In effect, the pizzicato was really a kind of percussion. This is very important, especially for music using special effects. Treat the effect according to its audible result, not according to who is playing. For example, some recent composers write key clicks for wind instruments. This is okay, but it that the key clicks are treated as a kind of soft percussion sound. To the ear, they have no similarity at all to normal woodwind sounds, and therefore should not be thought of as a woodwind timbre. In our last lesson, we introduced the idea of orchestral movement. Here's another version of our little example, now with added movement in the harp. Note that the harp part is melodically much less interesting than the oboe part. This is intentional, because the aim here is not to overshadow the oboe solo, but to complement it through contrast. Properly done, as here, the added movement makes the overall effect richer for the listener. One very subtle plane of tone found in lots of orchestral music is resonance. Think of the piano. 
The piano has a sustained pedal, and that adds enormously to the written music. Without the pedal, the piano sound is very dry. With it, although the sounds still die out, they are greatly enriched by the sympathetic vibrations in strings other than that of the notes being played. Let's see how this works in orchestral context. Here are a few bars from a Chopin waltz. If we orchestrate this note for note, here's the result. This sounds very dry. However, the piano version would normally play with pedal. Here's an orchestral version, now with horns adding resonance. Since resonance is not a foreground effect, it has to be orchestrated so as not to attract too much attention. This is why the horns here on the middle register, not too loud, and they simply hold a common tone in the harmony with no other activity. Although the things being equal, the more activity there is in a given plane of tone, the more attention it will attract. So the orchestrators have arranged the instruments providing resonance to move as little as possible and using quiet timbres. Incidentally, this difference between dry and resonant sound can be a really useful contrast in many other orchestration situations. It's exactly the kind of simple contrast effect that's an important key to colorful, successful orchestration. In our next lesson, we'll look at such contrast effects in more depth. <laughs>